to welcome our guests. We have Jacobo Marchese and Danny Taylor. These are plant-based bodybuilders, athletes. So welcome. And we're so excited to have you today. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. This is really exciting. You guys have this going like a well-oiled machine. I'm like, wow, <laughs> awesome. Well, it started with me and Chris uh, about two years ago. So we're, we, we've been practicing for a little while. So, But could you guys tell us a little about, about yourselves and maybe a little bit about your journey, what you offer, and then we can start asking a, a ton of questions. So I'm sure we will be getting some. Yeah, go for it. You go first. Sure. Well, a uh, brief little bit about me. I enjoy drumming and I like playing video games, but I mostly just work a little bit too much. I like to train a lot. As far as my background, I went vegan about 20 years ago. I was interested in fitness about 10 years before that, and it was to make the tennis team. But then I got into competitive bodybuilding, went vegan the more I learned about health and dietary cholesterol and taking care of myself and realized I couldn't help others until I led by example. Made the connection, embraced veganism, and that led me to my led me to meeting Danny, my wife, my business partner, and many of my colleagues and friends. And we do activism work together and put a good message out there. Yeah. So I I have a bit of a different story than Jack Mo. So I grew up in a really unhealthy household, uh, pretty overweight, uh, but everybody was. So I didn't think too much of it. <clears throat> I went vegetarian really young, like eight years old, uh, just for ethical reasons, and then. When I was 16, I was doing research in, on a paper about vegetarianism and decided to go vegan. It was something I'd never even heard of, again, for ethical reasons. But at this point, I was about 210 pounds um, at 16 years old. And going vegan, I did a terrible job going vegan, uh, just excluding animal products and basically eating like junky vegan food. But even still, the next time I went to the doctor, she was just like, hey, you're down 30 pounds. Like, what's up? And it was the first time I started to be like, oh, I actually have some control over my own physical being. Like, what if I actually learned something about nutrition? What if I actually tried? Because at that point I wasn't. And um, yeah, that was 20 years ago that I went vegan. And since then I've gotten healthier and healthier. Also found Giacomo, got into competitive bodybuilding and coaching other vegans and plant-based athletes specifically because there wasn't a lot of resources for those particular people back in the day and uh yeah that's led us to where we are now that's what we do full-time we coach plant-based people to reach their athletic goals awesome that's fabulous and these guys are really cool you guys gotta check out their website what is your website veganproteins.com awesome fueled, you fueled by the question where do you get your protein of course <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that you're solving the question with your URL. <laughs> Excellent. So docs, do you have any questions to get things started? We're getting a few questions already, but go ahead. I, I had a quick question. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that, you know, you were eating kind of unhealthy vegan food in the beginning. So how did you then transition to more of a whole food plant-based diet, which I'm assuming is what your diet is now? So Okay, a couple parts here. So the first thing was, yeah, I just excluded, at that point I was already vegetarian. So really I was just excluding dairy and eggs. So what that left me with at 16 years old was things like plain bagels and French fries and Coca-Cola, you know, all technically vegan, but not great for you. But, you know, I must have been creating a caloric deficit without realizing it is what happened. Um, but, you know, that sparked this curiosity. And then I started going to the library because this was 2002 and uh, there wasn't a ton of information. Like I didn't know how to find this information online, but I went to the library and started taking out vegan books, vegan cookbooks. Um, and there were so many different foods in there that I had never even heard of before. Quinoa, uh, which I pronounced quinoa for about two years because I'd never heard anybody else say it. Um, <laughs> avocados, mangoes, like things that I just hadn't had growing up. And, uh, you know, everybody thought I was going to eat a smaller variety of food that what I was about to do was very limiting. And actually it was the complete opposite. It opened up a whole new world um, of foods to me. And I would not say my diet is hundred percent whole food plant-based today, but it is predominantly whole food plant-based now. Um, and that was, you know, many years in the making. And I had a question because you're an athlete, athletes, and it's in your title. Um, do you guys suggest protein supplements for people? We don't 
recommend them per se. However, we're not in opposition to clients using protein supplements, whether it's out of convenience, whether it's to, you can bake and make recipes with them, et cetera, et cetera. So it really depends on the person. Yeah. So we, we never, nobody needs them, you know, but for some people they're convenient and they like them. And I don't think, I think if the choice is, you know, plant uh, animal proteins or plant-based protein powder, plant-based protein powder all the way. So yeah. Thank you. No problem. <clears throat> and do you help people with both um, workout regimens so that they can become bodybuilders if they're interested and nutrition or what kind of things are you guys coaching and helping people with? Everything. We have some uh, site visitors who come to us and they're like, I want to be a client and I'm willing to go plant-based to work with you because I like your results. And we have other other clients who come to us for lifestyle and we have competitive clients who are professionals and want to be at the top of their game. So really anyone who's looking to change your life and we work with their reasons as far as veganism and their interest in a plant-based diet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we do we do also write their workouts. The only exception is that we have a couple of um, like elite endurance athletes, um, and I consider us to be very very well versed in the strength sports. But um, we have a couple athletes who know way more about uh, endurance sports than we do. You know, they perform way at the top of their game. So they handle their their programming, and we handle uh, helping them out with their diet and making sure it supports that training. What do you think the main difference is between someone who's doing bodybuilding versus like an endurance sport as far as what your the requirements to sustain their activity? So I would say people who are doing endurance sports eat way more just in general. They, they are, you know, we think that weightlifting burns a ton of calories, but it actually doesn't really burn a ton of calories. Um, you know, having more muscle mass on your frame certainly you burn more calories just existing when you have more muscle on your frame, but that does not compare to people who are going out and, you know, cycling for six hours on a Saturday afternoon. They just need more food. And the purpose of the nutrition for an endurance athlete, the, the goal they're looking for is performance. They want to be faster. They want to, you know, win their race with bodybuilding, it's very different because when you compete in bodybuilding, nobody cares what you can do. It, you're literally, the goal is the aesthetic. So mm -hmm. the goal is completely based on what it looks like. Now that doesn't mean you have to completely neglect performance and health to do that, um, but it's just different, different motivations. Cool, very cool. Um, and then as far as, are you noticing uh, differences as far as women and men on, let's say like calorie restriction to get to that, you know, more aesthetic look. I mean, what is the difference? Like, is there an age that you're seeing different? Cause my poor ladies in their menopausal age, I think you and I talked a lot about this. Oh too, yeah. Was, was, <laughs> that seems to be so more difficult, you know, from a 30 year old woman to a 50 year old woman. And, you know, do you see the changes in men, anything like there, as far as age, as we get older and, you know, having the same benefits of weightlifting, is it a little harder work, more food, different food? What? So we, we typically try to keep fat a little bit higher because we're focused on hormonal health while someone is in a calorie deficit. We focus more on this with our female clients than our male clients, and age is definitely a factor. And we keep protein just a little bit higher. The changes are subtle. However, they are worth exploring. So keep protein a little bit higher. Try to prevent fat from going too low while a female client is in a caloric deficit, especially with bodybuilding. And age and metabolism is a factor for anyone, but this is typical. So I'm, I'm stereotyping here, female versus male. There are genetic outliers all over the place. There are, there are lean, uh, lean, mean female clients that can eat more than strong, big male clients that are half their age. So hmm. it all depends on the individual. It is true. I mean, what he's saying is true. There are outliers, but if you have to generalize, which I think is a smart thing, it's a smart starting place, right? You have to start somewhere. Um, women, absolutely. I would say after the age of 40, sometimes 45, um, it's a, it's a marked difference. They can feel it. They can see it. They're like, what is happening? Like I'm doing the exact same thing I did two years ago. And I feel like I'm getting totally different results and they're not imagining it. They're not, they didn't suddenly become lazy or slackers or something. Their bodies are changing. And I think it's really important to be very sensitive to that. And, you know, first of all, recognize that, yeah, 
it is harder. And there's no question that it's harder for women than men. Yes, every age affects everybody. But if you, if a, if a man is coming to us and they're looking to lose weight or body fat, the chart of their weight loss, it's almost like a perfect, beautiful line. Women, it's, it's never like that. It's like up and down and up and down. And, you know, hopefully trending in the right direction, but it's never linear for women, it seems. So all of that, I think, is definitely true. And then there's also, on top of that, I mean, I guess this is kind of true for everybody, but it's especially true for women. They are almost chronically under eating and mm -hmm. that they are, they are mm -hmm. cr chronically trying to diet. And if you compile that for a lifetime, and unfortunately we see a lot of women who have been trying to diet since they were 15 years old on and off for 30 or 40 years, there are effects from that. You know, your metabolism, we talk about it like it's this one thing, right? Um, it's not, but your metabolism is not just gonna bounce back because you got your nutrition on track at 50 years old, if you've been undercutting your nutritional needs for 30 years, it's not going to be that clean, if that makes sense. It's not going to be that, you're, it's not a clean slate at that point. And it's just important to recognize that. And that's why we try to catch people as early as possible and get them to start eating what they need earlier and earlier and try to get them out of this, like you need to constantly be dieting mindset, which is way more prevalent with women. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> do um, you guys use? Uh, do you guys have your clients use a specific app to track their food intake and energy expenditure? Go ahead. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, we with our clients, we largely rely on them feeling comfortable enough being open with us and letting us know what's going on, and they can track however they want. So some clients prefer to use MyFitnessPal, others will use the tracking tools on our website. Yeah, so MyFitnessPal is a really easy one. You know, most people are familiar with how to use it. A chronometer is another good one that does a better job tracking micronutrients, but MyFitnessPal is probably a little bit more user-friendly. Um, as far as tracking their caloric output, we don't have, a, a, again, unless they're an endurance athlete and where this becomes much more important, um, we don't, like requests that people do that. We know the workouts that they're doing because we're telling them to do them and then they tell us if they did it or not. So we have a pretty good idea, but a lot of people have Fitbits and Apple watches that are you know, giving them some data points anyway. And so they do share that with us sometimes. And some of them are pretty good. Some of them are pretty spot on for certain people. But like Giacomo said, there are outliers who, you know, their watch is super overestimating what they're burning or super underestimating what they're burning. So it's a really like person by person situation. Cool. We have some questions. Um, Claire is asking, what percentage of fat do you strive for in postmenopausal women? Is there something you've seen that's really a, a good number to look for? I don't like getting fat any lower than 40 grams. That's like ever, ever, yeah, I'm, for women, right? And not that I'm recommending it here because this is for competition, but it can we can walk it down as low as like the low 30s and even the high 20s on a compet with a competitive body. But that is an extreme, and that's something I do not recommend to the vast majority of people. So usually we're getting the number of 40 grams of fat or higher for the vast majority of scenarios. Yeah. So when it comes to they ask percentage, I don't really yeah. like to think in percentages. That's, um, it, it's something that I, I know we're all like, we've all been sort of trained like, oh, 30, 30, 40 or 80, 10, 10 or whatever. I don't like to think of it that way because your body has certain absolute needs. Um, so whether you're eating, you know, don't do this, but whether you're eating 1200 calories or 2,500 calories, you still shouldn't be dropping your fat below certain amounts. Um, so yeah, I mean, I would say like, bare bones, bottom, especially for women over 40, uh, I would not go below 40 grams. And if you can, if you, if it works for you in your life and your goals, I would say even 50 grams ish would be a good place. So depending on how much you're eating, that could work out to be 20%. That could work out to be, um, you know, 15% or 12%, just depending on how much food you're eating. And for women on body composition, what would be the fat composition that you're finding that would be a healthier body fat percentage structurally, like in the body? Yeah. 
Um, so higher than you'd like it to be. That's, <laughs> that's the answer. Um, no, seriously, uh, I would say like a healthy body fat percentage to be in is for a woman is like 20 to 25%. You're in pretty good shape. It's not until you get, you know, over like 30% ish that I would start to worry about someone's health. Um, most women who come chat with us, they want 15% body fat. And it's like, you could probably achieve that for a minute. Um, but to sustain that is going to be a lot of work for most people. Um, and you know, if you try to sustain that for too long, you could have hormonal implications from that. So, you know, we always think lower is better, lower is better, lower is better. Um, but you know, for if, to lump all women together, I would say like a happy place for most people is like, yeah, 18, maybe to 27 or so. So somewhere in there. Is there a way to measure that at home? Is do you find calipers or is there some of those uh, weights work better? What, what have you found? We typically go by site. We typically go by site. So I want to make sure my voice is louder. <laughs> and when when you start to see a lot of lines and detail on your frame, you're probably getting below 20%. Mm -hmm. So, and there are different charts that show you what different, bo different body fats look like. And granted, the body types are different, but there are some pretty decent charts you can get uh, some sort of uh, idea of what you look like as long as you're honest with yourself and you know your body composition well. But if you want like just an at-home tool, there are those floor scales, those bioimpedance scales that will tell you your body fat. It's important to realize like they're not accurate. The, the, the most accurate way that you can get your body fat uh, measured is a DEXA scan or a bone density scan, uh, which you can't even do in a lot of states. We can't do it here, for example. Um, and if you do have a state where you're allowed to do it, it's very expensive. It's not, it's not reasonable. Um, calipers can be great, but you need to be trained how to use them. And most of us aren't. So you're going to get a different measurement every time. So I do kind of like the floor scales, even though the exact number it's giving you is probably not going to be right. If you're stepping on it, you know, once a week, every week, and the number's going up, chances are your body fat percentage is going up. If it's coming down, it's probably coming down. Um, so even though they're not perfect, I think, I think some of them can be pretty good. Catherine asked a question. What can you do naturally to build bone strength? I've been eating hundred percent vegan since October of 21, I'm guessing she's on 69 and her oncologist wants to start a medication. Any, any thoughts there? Is there any particular exercises that you see the bigger bang for lift, I guess? So strength training in general, resistance training period, that doesn't have to look like what it looks like on a bodybuilder. Um, if you are not exercising right now, doing body weight squats or push-ups against the wall, like all of those weight bearing exercises will help with bone density. I mean, you, the doctors here probably know better than I, I don't know if it's possible to build bone density, uh, at 69 years old, but certainly you can do a lot of things to mitigate the loss of more bone density. Um, so resistance bands and doing resistance training with just bands or body weight exercises, like literally squatting into a chair and standing up over and over um, every single day. Those are great ways to resistance train your body. And if anybody's listening and they're younger and want to start, you can build bone density uh, at a younger age simply by, you know, eating enough and resistance training. And that will help you when you get to the age where you start to you know, naturally lose some bone density. Yeah, no problem. I would also suggest using a, a weight vest when you're walking. Mm. Flowers. That's a great them. idea. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, I'm not familiar with the, I don't know anything about medications that I'm not going to pretend to. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure you no, guys do. <laughs> that's a diff, that's a whole nother conversation. Um, but as far as just, you know, like are there particular exercises you're seeing that would do that like what what should they be focused in on is there what would you recommend as as far as you know if there's someone got limited things let's say they're at home what can they do like squats is it deadlifts what what would be the best hmm. well i like body weight squats and some sort of so for a lower body exercise for an upper body exercise something that's going to focus on your chest and your back and your shoulders. So like Danny was recommending 
maybe trying to do push-ups instead of um, doing a, the standard push-up, do one on your knees. Uh, an overhead pressing movement can be helpful. Uh, it's like a curling press. Planks are good. Yep, planks are really good. So you can take your band and um, you can curl it and then overhead press it. And I like that. You get some good bang for your buck that way. And, and you don't have to just use bands. Like you can use soup cans, you know? If you have soup cans, you can use that. Water bottles, you can use that. I would say squatting, if I had to pick one exercise, like the do or die exercise, it's squatting because you hopefully, you want to be able to do that forever. You want to be able to sit down and get up off the toilet. You want to be able to get out of your chair forever. <laughs> so squats would be the number one that I would say. And if you are good at squatting, just sitting, you know, squatting down onto a chair and getting back up, hold something, you know, hold a, a gallon of something out to your chest tight and start practicing it that way. I would also say deadlifts, and I know that's a really scary sounding exercise to a lot of people, but essentially all a deadlift is, is picking something up off the floor. Um, again, this is something that you hopefully are going to be able to do for a very long time. So, I mean, you don't have to have a barbell and weight plates to do deadlifts. You can practice it with your bags of groceries, like a suitcase deadlift, you know, with a bag on either side, just keep your back nice and flat, lift with your legs and practice standing up with those or your laundry basket same thing like if you're putting your groceries away like think of the activities that you do every day and those are the kinds of extra you want to find exercises that sort of mimic those things and do them you know three times a week you just pick an exercise of each one like the squat the deadlift the overhead press uh, maybe a row where you're pulling something towards you, like like you would do a heavy door if you were walking in somewhere, um, and just do those exercises like three times a week. And if you're not, if you haven't been doing that before, you're going to notice improvements with just that. I just want to emphasize, um, thank you guys for that. That uh, for anyone doing these, make sure you're doing it with proper form because mm -hmm. you can hurt yourself if you just start deadlifting or pre even, you know, even a water bottle and you just start bending over and picking it up. So you want to make sure your back is bent straight. And you guys probably have videos and information about that on your website. But um, I know when I first started and I was using a trainer, I was corrected constantly. I had no idea mm -hmm. my form was so off. And I thought, oh, I'm young. I'm, I work out. I can do this. But I had poor, horrible form, and if I would have kept doing that, I probably would have injured myself. So I always mm -hmm. emphasize to people to really make sure you're working with someone, that you're looking in a mirror, that you make sure that you're getting it straight, getting it right. Yeah, you're you're totally right. And the thing is, is most of us are picking up our laundry basket off the floor wrong. You know, mm -hmm. most of us are getting off the toilet wrong. And a lifetime of that is where you get people with like low back pain. And um, so if you have the, if you have the privilege to be able to, you know, even just have one or two sessions with a physical therapist or a personal trainer, they're going to be able to assess you and your needs and hopefully, you know, literally manually manipulate you in the right positions. Because if you've never been in those positions before, how would you know what it feels like? Mm -hmm. So yeah, there is something to be said for, uh, meeting with a professional in person who can help you learn these things and then practicing them over and over again. And Kim, did you have a recommendation of a brand of weight vest? Someone was asking. That's a really good question. Actually, I just took my significant other's uh, fishing vest to put some weights in and then added more and more and more. So a backpack, something like that. You want something that's tight to your body and not all over the place. Um, and don't go crazy with too many weights to begin with, add a little bit more at a time. But um, I found that going online and buying a weight vest was too expensive. So I just did it that way. I had gotten a weight vest years ago and um, I got mine from drfurman.com. And um, the reason I went with Tim back then was because um, it explains, they had the weights, they were half pound weights and they were like at the top, the front and the back and then mid body in front and back. And so you, they explain sort of where to start. You want to start higher up, make sure it's equal and start in low amounts so you don't hurt yourself. And so if you're totally new to this or you're not sure, um, cause sometimes if a backpack, like Kim was saying, if it's not tight to your body or if it doesn't fit you well, or the weight's not distributed right, you could actually injure yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and so this way I felt a little safer, but again, it is, it was expensive and you can get them on Amazon now too, with the little weights that you can put across so you can find cheaper versions of that. So you have options. Perfect. 
Um, another question is, what if you have someone who's trying to gain weight? What would you recommend? If you have someone that's trying to gain weight, what do we recommend as far as nutrition training? Both, one or the other, yeah. Track, uh, keep a food journal for three days, find out how much you're eating. It's easier than doing guesswork and feeling out of control or, you know, one day you're trying, you think you're eating too much, the next day you think you're not eating enough. Keep a food journal for three days and then eat more. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that sounds so simple, but it, it's kind of true. We meet a lot of um, people who do want to, they want to gain weight, you know, quality weight. They want to gain muscle. And they say, man, no matter what I do, I just can't gain any weight. And then they'll write down what they're doing and they might have one day where they do eat in a caloric surplus and great job. But then the next day they're really full from the day prior mm -hmm. and then they under eat like without realizing it. Um, so, you know, a lot, it's very easy as somebody who was formerly obese for me to be like, I don't understand what these people are talking about, but, <laughs> but I've seen it and, you know, everybody has their struggle. If, if your goal is to lose weight, that's going to be hard, but there's plenty of people who their goal is to gain weight. And that's going to take work too, and consistently making sure that you're eating more. So whole food, plant-based, but calorie dense foods, because plant-based foods, one of the great things about them is they're so nutrient dense and calorie light. Great. When you want to lose weight and fill up on fruits and veggies and fiber and all of that rough when you're trying to gain weight because you get so full so fast. So things like uh, nuts and seeds, avocados, uh, some of the fruits, if you really are what we call a hard gainer, if you really have a hard time um, getting the calories in, this is where something like a trail mix or dried fruits can be helpful, which is something when someone's trying to lose weight, we usually say, hey, you probably shouldn't do this because it adds up really, really quickly. Um, but if you're in the opposite boat, you know, putting a handful of trail mix on your oatmeal in the morning, that can add two or 300 calories and you almost don't feel it um, in your stomach. So yeah, but definitely tracking because you can't manage what you don't measure. So keeping track of it and increasing it is a good place to start. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you might, don't forget smoothies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey. <laughs> um, hi, hi everybody. How are you? Hi, um, hi there. Hey. Sorry, I'm late. I thought we were doing this on Friday. Um, oh, we have Thursdays and Fridays. It's Thursday and week. Friday. We're alternating, Dr. K. Got it. Sorry about that. <clears throat> um, so I joined late, but I heard a little wisp about a weighted vest, uh, which I think are wonderful things to, to do. I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, and, and like everybody else who does nutrition counseling for the vegan community and you know, plant-based folks, I've got skinny vegans who want to put on some some weight here and we're all uh, we all wrestle with that a bit uh actually the two converge um nicely and um one thing that i've had success with uh again i know go back to mother nature here um if you look at the vegan animals you look at the antelopes and gazelles giraffes you know they're they're lean muscular animals and they um you know they're eating high carbohydrates, high fiber foods all day, they're grazing. Um, and yet they don't become obese, but they're flipping around big, heavy bones and muscles. Uh, you know, their, their body mass is significant. And, and over time, you know, day after day, month after month, year after year, the muscles uh, accommodate to this and, and metabolism sends uh, energy rich, molecules to muscles, ATPs, all that kind of stuff. So uh, where, where I'm going with this is that one of the nice things about the vest is that you don't need a lot of weight. Um, and you can, uh, I tell the folks, you know, get one of these vests with the all the pockets, start with an empty vest, just put it on, put a t-shirt over it, nobody needs to know you're wearing it. You just wear it around the house, go to the post office, you just wear the thing for a day or two or three, just to get used to it. Uh, and then pop in, you know, when you're comfortable, uh, half pound, like pound, two pounds at the most, and just, just pop that on every day. And again, uh, you have to make a big deal of it, just wear it during the day, you can vacuum the house. But the best, of course, is uh, going out for a good walk, maybe grab a couple of two pound, three pound hand weights and, uh, and your weighted vest and go for a nice 40 minute walk. You know, that's the Cadillac uh, treatment uh, for building up bones and muscles. 
but just just wearing it and then after a week or two or three you bump it up another two pounds uh, and uh till you get it up to four, four about six pounds is the most all you need to do and just wear that for an hour a day all, all day if you can and like the antelope and the gazelle, whatever, the, the steady way getting in and out of the car, walking up steps, carrying packages with the, with the vest there, adds that little bit of weight, movement after movement, hour after hour. And, you know, the tortoise won the race, you know, step by step, we'll get you there. And as the months go by, watch if that if good muscle doesn't appear on your axial skeleton, on your, your, next to your spine, uh, but certainly in your legs and arms. And be patient. So it takes you three months. It takes you six months. But you'll you'll put on, uh, I dare say, three, five, eight pounds of, of good muscle and, and good healthy fatty tissue and blood vessels that go along with it. And and so you know it takes you you know a few months to get there. Uh, patience and perseverance, uh, magic ingredients here. So uh, so the so that absolutely that high density nutrition uh, program that was just outlined by our very wise guest. Yes, it's absolutely important. Keep those high protein calorie dense foods going in, but then you know, stress that skeleton a little bit every day and, and watch it turn into good muscle and a, and a lean, healthy body with some, some good strength there. My suggestion there. Very good. Um, we have another question. So what are the measures of success? For example, how do you encourage an older person that yes, they're making progress, even though they are not getting the same results compared to when they were 30. So when you're working with someone, how often would you say, is it lifting heavier weights, more repetitions? Like what, what do you look for? Measuring success is consistency and knowing what's happening and seeing progress. And progress by any measure is success. As far as getting in more reps, and I feel like when it comes to training, there's this focus on how strong you can be and how much resistance you're using. And I think the wiser you become, the more you realize that movement patterns matter. You not only need to be moving safely, you need to be moving well. And eventually you hit a plateau at any age. I don't care if you're 20 or if you're 80. And when you hit that plateau, the only way you're going to get through it is by improving your technique. And that's how you're going to become stronger. So if you lead with that, you're more likely to celebrate your successes by focusing on efficiency and then working your way towards technical mastery. But in more simplistic terms, like just moving safely, moving well, and celebrating the fact that you're, you're becoming more able-bodied. And as a result, you get stronger. I mean, even with younger athletes who move barbells, we tell them, hey, you're not gonna put much more weight in this barbell, but be, as, as you become a barbell technician, you're going to wind up getting stronger and you can move a barbell at any age with proper training, in all honesty. Yeah, I would also say, you know, there they are similar measures to success. It might just be smaller amounts or slower progress, but really what we're looking for at any age is have we increased your capacity to do work? Um, so are you seeing increases in any one of these places? Is your strength increasing? Is the amount of reps you're able to do increasing? Uh, is your volume increasing? Is it getting easier in any way? Like all of these things would be markers that you are improving. And I know that that's not as clear, clear cut as like, oh, the number on the scale changed. Like that's a very easy thing to quantify, but that's actually really not a great marker of success most of the time. But are you getting stronger? Is this getting easier? Is your day-to-day -day life, are the tasks you have to do in your day-to-day -day life feeling easier? Then you are absolutely making progress because you're increasing your work capacity over time. And again, like Jocko said, you can do that at any age. Excellent. Any other questions? I know we're kind of past our half hour mark. 40 I love that definition of success. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Function's the name of the game. Function. Uh, amen. Great. Good for you guys. So remind us again, I'm going to put you up here on speaker view, where they can find you. And if you have any final uh, thoughts and wisdom to share. <laughs> uh, there, it's never too late to start again. You can be active, fit and healthy at any age. You have so much support right here. Reach out to any one of us as far as where to find Danny and I. Go to veganproteins.com and hit the contact button, and I promise you, you'll get a response as well as access to lots of free resources like recipes, 
and workouts. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you both for joining us. This was wonderful. And sorry if we didn't get to everybody's questions, but we try to be close of everybody's time and we appreciate you uh, sharing your experience with us. And I'm hoping that someone will come and seek your help and we'll see benefit and be happy to hear about it if that happens. So thanks everyone. And uh, yeah, Docs, thank you, you for have, having us. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Docs, anything you'd like to say before we go? I just want to say thank you for coming on. It's really great to hear the things that you recommend. I'm going to start doing those body weight squats today. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Yeah. I'm so happy. This is an honor to get to speak amongst you guys. We were, when we were coming, we were like, wow, we're going to go talk with doctors now. This is crazy. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you guys for having us. This was great. <laughs> oh, it was a delight. And, uh, thanks again. And uh, like everyone said, just check out the YouTube page. It, this will stay on the Facebook page and we appreciate you. And uh, we'll go live again next Friday at 1130 Mountain Time. I have to do the which day I'm in. And then uh, the other thing is um, we're going to be working on a some of the bring the docs on the healthy human revolution podcast. So that's what we're doing tomorrow, but that won't be live, but just want to share that with you guys. And at the end of the month, we're being in the sure's eyes, um, who everybody loves in the doors and, uh, looking forward to that. So we'll see you guys then. And thanks for joining us.